Welcome, everyone. My name is Kevin Gallagher. I'm the director of Boston University's Global Development Policy Center, or the GDP Center, as we like to call ourselves. Our mission is to advance policy oriented research on financial stability, human well being, and environmental sustainability across the world. And one of our four major research clusters is called the Global China Initiative. And so here we host something called the Global China Research Colloquium, where we host GDP center researchers and pioneering researchers from around the world that are looking at the nexus of uh, what the economic, social, and environmental impacts of Chinese overseas engagement are uh, in emerging market and developing countries. Before I introduce today's uh, lecture, I actually want to invite you all to come back tomorrow. They actually, these are two, two, two webinars are a really interesting pair. Uh, in our other one of our another initiatives called the Global Economic Governance Initiative, we have a new book series where pioneering work in political economy uh, folks with new books come and talk with uh, Bill Kring, our executive director here. And tomorrow we're going to have Professor Stephen Kaplan from George Washington University has a real frontier new book called Globalizing Patient Capital: The Political Economy of Chinese Finance in the Americas. That'll be at 10 a.m. EST. Uh, tomorrow, and we'll put a note about that in the chat. But it, uh, it, it's with great pleasure that, uh, that we welcome Dar Dr. Carlos Larea today. Uh, he is a professor of social sciences at the University Andina Simon Bolivar in Quito, Ecuador. Uh, and today we will be talking about his na native Ecuador uh, and its uh, negotiations with China over its debt situation. Uh, Ecuador has really been mired in a, in a triple crisis over the past few years. Uh, one of the countries the most hard hit from the pandemic, uh, both from a health perspective, number one, two, it's in the middle of a financial and debt crisis, and three, uh, it as the most biodiverse country in the world uh, that is also a key part of the global oil economy. It's also an integral part of uh, solutions for both global climate change, uh, local biodiversity, and the indigenous people that are so part, uh, integral part of the uh, Ecuadorian Amazon. Uh, Ecuador uh, over the past few years um, has, uh, has had uh, unsustainable debts uh, and has been in the midst of uh, trying to deal with those. Uh, it's uh, previous, pre uh, because of rising oil prices and some profligacy of the previous president, the, uh, the country had to go to the International Monetary Fund a few years ago uh, with a pretty draconian austerity plan that if you remember the newspapers, uh, because the plan required that, uh, that fossil uh, fuel subsidies had to be cut for the poor, the protests were so big that they had to move the capital away from, from Quito for, for a little while to Guayaquil. Uh, that uh, program is now in place. And then in 2020, Ecuador negotiated a debt workout with its private creditors. Uh, that uh, that is seen it was relatively quick uh, relative to the to the history of, of sovereign debt workouts with private sector actors and the last big piece in Ecuador's debt profile so it has a program with the International Monetary Fund it has a debt workout with the private sector but another large creditor for Ecuador is China and uh, just la just a week and a half ago. Uh, the new president of Ecuador went to China to be part of the Olympics uh, and came back with two things. Uh, one, Ecuador is now uh, in process to be a member of the Belt Road Initiative. And two, the uh, president basically got a green light to start negotiations about, uh, about debt relief and negotiating the debt with China. Carlos Raya and two of his colleagues, uh, Jesus Ramos, and Andres Aruas uh, have a plan for how uh, Ecuador could in part reduce its debt burden and protect the environment and indigenous people at the same time uh, while helping uh, China be a leader in global climate change and global biodiversity, uh, two things that it's really showed some leadership on over the past couple of years. Um, so we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Larea uh, present, present this proposal. Uh, in the chat here, we will put uh, the Spanish language version of the full proposal, so folks can download that. If uh, Spanish isn't uh, isn't your isn't your language, uh, he did publish some um, some op-ed articles about this uh, upon Lasso's trip to China, 
in English and in Chinese. And so we'll put those short summaries in there. Um, it's my understanding that the proposal itself uh, will soon be in English and in Chinese as well. Let me just tell you a little bit more about, uh, about Carlos before I hand it over to him. Uh, he teaches courses at, at, uh, at the university on development, climate change, and research methods. He has a PhD in political economy from York University and further doctoral work on development and health at, at Harvard. Uh, outside teaching he, at Ecuador, he's taught in Canada and Australia, and he's a visiting fellow at the School of Politics and International Relations at the Australian National University. He's held various research appointments at Harvard, York, and Flexo. Uh, and he's published around 15 books and 85 articles to date. Outside uh, academia, uh, he was a technical advisor to the Yasuni Initiative in Ecuador. And, uh, and this new initiative that he's proposing now is, is in that spirit. Uh, Carlos has really been uh, uh, on the forefront of, po of proposing positive uh, solutions for Ecuador that are good for the environment, good for people, and good for the economy. Uh, he advocated biodiversity for indigenous rights in Yasuni National Park. He's also been a consultant to UNDP, UNICEF, the ILO, the World Bank, and the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, we're really excited to have Carlos with us here. He'll share the basic tenets of his proposal with you over the next 25 to 30 minutes. And if you could uh, think about some questions, we'll have a global conversation about his proposal when he's done. If you look in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Please do two things. One, introduce yourself, tell us who you are, where you're from, and two, put in a question. And after Carlos is done with his presentation, I will field some of those questions and we can have a global conversation about that. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'll pass it over to Carlos Correa. Thank you very much, Kevin, for this introduction. Um, I first also want uh, to, to thank Boston University for organizing this colloquium. And for my presentation, and I'm going to share the, the screen. I, I, I brought a, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I'm going basically to make a short introduction about the current situation in Ecuador. And then I will I will present uh, the, the substantial elements of our proposal. Uh, first, uh, I think it's very important to, to explain that Ecuador is, as Kevin said, one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. Here, we have some maps recently done by a group of uh, international scientists working on uh, on the Amazon basin in South America. And um, the maps show uh, the uh, biodiversity in amphibians, birds, mammals, and uh, vascular plants. Once all these uh, maps are uh, superimposed, that uh, we have the synthesis map, which is presented in the right side. In, in, in red, they are the places in the Amazon basin in which you have the highest uh, number of uh, species in the four uh, groups, amphibians, birds, mammals, and plants. They are concentrated uh, here. Uh, in the Ecuadorian Amazon, particularly uh, around the Yasuni National Park and in the upper Napo River Basin, uh, which is also shared with Peru. Well, this is an interesting explanation about why Ecuador is actually one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. But uh, in the case of Ecuador, uh, here we have a map of the Ecuadorian Amazon in the red color, you can see the effects of oil expansion in the northern Ecuadorian Amazon. The, the, the red parts are completely deforested areas. Oil extraction began in Ecuador about 50 years ago. And unfortunately, recent information coming from satellite information from the Global Forest Watch 
demonstrated that uh, uh, primary forest loss uh, linked with deforestation is going up in Ecuador very quickly in the last years. The oil is actually the most important indirect driver of deforestation in Ecuador. Here we can uh, uh, move to the evolution of the Ecuadorian economy uh, since 1980 to, to present. Uh, I'm taking the per capita GDP and we can see we have about uh, 20 years of economic uh, stagnation during the, uh, the application of the structural adjustment policies. They ca came from 2004 to 2014 an expansion, uh, uh, actually a very fast expansion of the Ecuadorian economy based uh, mostly on very favorable oil prices during the uh, uh, commodity super cycle. And in 2014, and that's very important, a deep crisis began with a collapse of oil prices. Uh, 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 and uh, the recent expansion of COVID which was very, very dramatic in Ecuador. So we have a substantial drop in per capita GDP. Uh, and finally, I, I'm going to present uh, the, the latest uh, forecast from the International Monetary Fund. And according with, with the, that information, in 2026, Ecuador will still uh, keep it beyond, uh, below uh, the per capita, about 10% below the maximum uh, per capita GDP reached in 2014. So Ecuador is facing a long-term crisis and even uh, 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 taking into account that we are going to have uh, some recovery, the recovery will be slow and, and Ecuador is facing a kind of long-term crisis. Despite even the recent increase in oil prices, we are not sure how long it will last. Uh, this is very important here. We have a, a chart about uh, the evolution of foreign debt in Ecuador from uh, the mid 1990s uh, to present. Uh, uh, during the period of structural adjustment, we have an important uh, foreign debt, but it was slowly declining. Then uh, during the commodity super cycle, actually in 2008, Ecuador decided a, a cancellation and unilateral cancellation of some bonds related debt. And these, as, as a result of the, that, we have an important reduction, initial reduction of debt, but Ecuador was not a, a, able to continue a, in, in the international credit market. As a result of that, Ecuador was, suffered a very, very important uh, debt uh, uh, the financial uh, uh, crisis, but uh, uh, the uh, change to, towards China as a, the main creditor allowed the country to continue uh, uh, being receiving foreign debt. And then from uh, 2008 uh, to present, uh, Ecuador increased dramatically it's in indebtedness, mostly with, with China. When the crisis began in, in 2014, uh, structural adjustment policies were, uh, were in part avoided uh, uh, by increasing uh, foreign debt, mostly with, with China. So here we have a chart about the, the, the expansion of uh, Chinese debt in Ecuador from 2009 uh, to present, actually it reached a, a very high amount about uh, close to $10 billion in 2016. And ever since uh, actually uh, debt was, Chinese debt was uh, began, it actually began to, to be reduced. And now uh, the, the current balance is about uh, $5 billion. Uh, China is still the most important bilateral creditor of Ecuador. Summarizing, Ecuador has an oil dependent economy since 1972 uh, with very poor economic diversification. 
during the commodity super cycle, uh, public, public expenditure actually soared with a very, very strong uh, public investment after the collapse of oil prices in 2004, Ecuador began a period of a crisis, but uh, the need of a fiscal adjustment was postponed by uh, increasing foreign debt indebtedness, mostly with China, as the uh, further borrowing became less feasible. Ecuador signed in 2010, in 2020, uh, an agreement with IMF uh, for, for structural adjustment. However, uh, the debt bar burden in Ecuador is still very, very, very large. It represents about 45% uh, of GDP. And the final problem, which it contributes to create a, a, a serious constraint for the case of Ecuador is that oil reserves are limited and it probably won't allow the country to continue being an oil exporter for more than a decade. So Ecuador needs a deep change in, their, in its development strategy. Basically, those are the, the, the current uh, threats of the situation, low oil reserves, a heavy debt burden, and uh, uh, an important uh, uh, remaining debt, mostly with China, which is the most important uh, bilateral creditor. The most important creditor now is the IMF, but the second uh, most important one is China. Well, uh, now we can turn to the explanation of our proposed debt for conservation swap. The basic idea is that Ecuador might commit itself to a reduction of uh, deforestation rates by 47%, by redu reducing by a half deforestation in Ecuador in the next 10 years in exchange for, uh, uh, for a 100 million debt reduction uh, with China. As a result of uh, reducing deforestation, 200,000 hectares will be uh, saved and uh, is uh, more than a um, hundred million tons of carbon dioxide emission will be avoided. That is very significant even at the international level. Uh, how we, we can uh, implement this project. Basically, the idea is to use real-time satellite, satellite monitoring, incentives to conservation, and a strong sanction to deforestation uh, to allow this uh, important, significant reduction of deforestation to take place. In addition to that, in our papers, we are presented a small uh, swap uh, program which will allow an Amazonian, a recently created Amazonian University, IKEA, uh, to uh, become benefited uh, from a, a, a small swap, which allowed the university to expand its conservation and biodiversity research project. Actually, the university was mostly created and expanded using uh, uh, Chinese credit. Uh, strategically, the, the proposal mostly will allow and foster a smooth transition in the case of Ecuador towards a low emission development path. Here we have an idea about uh, uh, current deforestation rates, the loss of a primary forest, and uh, the, the net effect of the proposal reduction uh, which will save around, as, as I said, around uh, 200,000 hectares. How can we expect that the proposal will be implemented? Actually, uh, this proposal is based on a very successful experience that Brazil had uh, between 2005 and 2012 
uh, with its uh, strategy uh, to reduce deforestation, Brazil reached an 84% deforestation decline during that period with uh, foreign support, mostly from Norway and Germany, which reached $1.2 billion. It was actually uh, the most uh, significant success in reducing deforestation among Amazon countries. Uh, unfortunately, it was reversed uh, uh, in the last years by Bolsonaro. However, uh, as a strategy, it proved to be feasible and actually it, it was based on an integrated approach in which uh, deforestation reduction was a high political priority uh, and the combination of uh, satellite monitoring, law enforcement, conservation incentives, and international support was a key to the success of uh, this Brazilian experience. Uh, we think that this strategy might be potentially replicated in other Amazon countries, obviously changing some specific traits of each one of, of the countries. Here uh, we have uh, 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 a simplified uh, chart explaining why Ecuador will no longer be able to continue being a net oil exporter. Actually, according with British Petroleum, uh, in the most recent report, 2021, uh, oil, problem oil reserves in Ecuador will last only seven more years uh, given the current uh, oil extraction rates. Uh, probably uh, uh, this is going to, to last a little bit more. However, uh, all the statistical information suggests us that Ecuador will be running out of oil in, in the next uh, few years, or probably not more than a decade, and will become an oil importer in the future. That is why Ecuador needs an international support from a smooth transition away from an extractive based economy towards a low emission economy based on biodiversity service and ecotourism. From the Chinese perspective, I think this proposal is also a, a, a significant contribution to implement a new Chinese policies. First, in the last five years, environmental protection, climate change mitigation, and biodiversity conservation are regarded as top priorities top priorities in the new China national and global strategy. China wants to take a global leadership role in biodiversity finance. China hosts last year a COP on biodiversity and created the Kunming Biodiversity Fund, which was established just for this kind of opportunities. China, China is also willing to consider a re, a debt renegotiation and sharing conservation goals. Recently, China uh, uh, actually rescheduled uh, nearly $9 million in Ecuadorian debt payments. And uh, the recent uh, visit uh, to Pekin from our president also is based in this willingness to, from China to continue uh, red uh, uh, renegotiation uh, and possible uh, de uh, future uh, debt reductions. Uh, so uh, this proposal will also uh, uh, guarantee uh, 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 an, an adequate and, and sure debt repayment uh, from Ecuador, uh, uh, allowing China to receive uh, the, the payment and also allowing Ecuador uh, a smooth transition towards a new biodiversity-based economy in the future. Finally, I think it is also very important to stress 
that Amazon conservation is a world priority, not, so, not only for, for Ecuador, but also for the eight Amazon countries, including Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Venezuela, and Bolivia, and the Guyanas. Uh, I would like only to remind that uh, the Amazon is the largest remaining rainforest in the world, uh, that it provides important climate regulation and carbon sequestration for the planet, that deforestation, according with research research from the scientific panel for the Amazon, is increasing in all Amazon countries, and uh, the the threat of a tipping point in which a non-reversible process of savanization of Amazon can be unleashed as a result of climate change, forest fires, and increasing degradation. So the, the Amazon is facing now a, a very important dilemma and uh, stopping deforestation, eliminating deforestation is a top priority, not only for Amazon countries, but for the world as a whole. In the recent uh, Glasgow COP, more than 100 countries committed themselves to uh, eliminating deforestation in the next 10 years. Uh, I'm not sure if it is going to, to be fulfilled, but uh, there is a global, increasing global concern about the importance of uh, eliminating deforestation as soon as possible uh, in tropical forests, particularly in the case of Amazonian basin. That is why this proposal uh, can be implemented as a contribution to that a goal at the world level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlo. A lot of, uh, a lot of rich information there. Uh, for those of you in the audience, thanks for your patience during the presentation. And now it's, now it's your turn. Uh, as I said in the beginning of the seminar, on the bottom right-hand corner, there's a little Q&A button. Uh, please uh, pop your name in there and share a question. And I'll share a few of these with, uh, uh, with Professor Larea. Uh, the first one is from Jerry Harris from the Global Studies Association. And he asked, what, what's, what's the context? Uh, uh, obviously, the President Lasso has, com has come back. Uh, from China with a BRI membership and an agreement to negotiate. Uh, uh, is there support uh, for this proposal in the government uh, or in social and environmental movements in Ecuador? Uh, and if not, is there, is there a plan to reach out to, to gather support for this? That's one question. Uh, then we have uh, Robert Walker. Um, and Robert asks, what are the pressures? Sorry, you want to, uh, looks like you're getting it getting a notebook to, to write some of these down. I don't want to hit you with all of them in the... Uh, Robert Walker asked, what are the pressures for de deforestation and what are likely to be the social costs of stopping deforestation? Uh, Paul Cisnernos is a professor of uh, public policy in Quito. And uh, his question is uh, uh, about the importance of generating trust between Ecuador and China to carry this proposal further. Uh, we know that a key element of the Yasuni was related to a lack of trust between Ecuador and the main donors, especially Germany. How can this trust be built in context of weakening state capacity, according to Paul Cisnernos? Uh, then we have Yan Wang, a uh, Chinese economist, uh, former World Bank economist who's now on our team. Um, she says, China has been helping developing countries to build infrastructure, which is part of public assets. I think these assets in developing countries are undervalued. The biodiversity in Ecuador is also undervalued. How are we going to fix this pricing or valuation problem and how to create a system of valuation and scoring to correctly value this green asset so it's seen as an asset, not a liability? So there's more questions pouring in, but we'll let you take uh, uh, respond to those uh, before we go to a new round. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. I, I am trying to, to answer uh, the questions. Uh, first, I, I think uh, in Ecuador, uh, we are beginning to disseminate a proposal 
and trying in this first stage to gain support from the civil society. According with the several opinion uh, polls, in the last years, public opinion in Ecuador is uh, favorable to conservation policies. We have a national referendum uh, about three years ago on more than 70%, around 70% of the votes uh, favored uh, um, uh, implement some restriction to extractive activities such as oil exploitation and large scale mining. Uh, so I think uh, it is the time to, to, to increase uh, the support from this kind of proposal from the civil society. I think uh, uh, the government doesn't not uh, we, we are just initiating some dialogue with the Minister of the Environment and other instance in the government uh, uh, to get some support. But I think the first stage will be to consolidate the, the, the support from the civil society. Uh, how uh, the protection reduction can be implemented? I think a key point is to get some social support from that. Actually, the, the immediate the most uh, important deforestation drivers in the case of Ecuador are small migrant peasants, which uh, uh, went uh, to the Amazon, uh, coming from other regions in Ecuador. So at, so at the same time, we need to create opportunities uh, for conservation uh, based on incentives uh, towards other uh, activities uh, such as tourism, ecotourism, uh, agroforestry, and so on. So we need a combined strategy based not only on sanctions to deforestation, but also social incentives, mostly to uh, peasants and small farmers in the Amazon. Uh, I think, well, uh, in, the, in the case of Ecuador, uh, we need actually to, to consolidate policies that can address the most important issues related to the need of a new strategy, a new development strategy in Ecuador. Actually, the, the current government is trying to expand both oil extraction and large scale mining. I, in my opinion, this strategy is wrong, it's difficult to implement, and Ecuador must sooner or later needs to address the need for a strategy to support transitions towards a sustainable low emission economy. That is very important. I think after the recent Glasgow COP and in the new international environment, I think Ecuador can obtain an important international support for a transition to a new economy. Uh, I think, uh, well, the problem of uh, uh, undervaluing biodiversity is a global problem, but I think uh, we have positive changes in the last years. And now we, we have uh, new international funds uh, to finance uh, conservation uh, bi biodiversity conservation. So I think we are trying uh, slowly, but we, the, the new international context, context may allow uh, to overcome, to partially overcome this problem of uh, undervaluing biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, lots more questions here. Uh, one from Raul Liebert. Uh, Asked an important question. Um, so say this debt uh, proposal goes through uh, you talk about uh, seven years of, uh, of, of oil left in the country. What, uh, what does Ecuador do to replace the foreign revenue, the external currency revenues? Uh, and does this plan address that at all? Uh, is it just a short-term debt reduction that will also help natural assets? But how does, uh, how does Ecuador improve its balance of payments situation? We have one from Xi'an Zhu a former World Bank staffer and a former staffer at the New Development Bank or the BRICS Bank. Just to ask a, a, an informational question, who are the Chinese creditors? Uh, is it the central government? 
state-owned commercial banks, policy banks, et cetera? Uh, and is it mostly concessional finance uh, or commercial finance? Um, let's see. Leonardo Stanley, uh, former visiting fellow here, uh, says the Ecuadorian government is calling for new oil expl exploration in Yasuni. This will increase climate change related risks and jeopardize indigenous people and the integrity of biodiversity. What are your comments on that as an architect of the Yasuni plan? And then Imani Fairweather Morrison says, if the country will run out of oil in a couple decades or so, instead of importing, why not invest in a transition for key sectors of the society, which are currently fossil fuel based? In addition to conservation and education, can some of the swap funds be directed towards a transition plan? If not, the country will later borrow to finance the transition and will find itself back into a debt problem. Similar question to Raul Lieberts. Thank you, why don't you take those? Uh, thank you. Well, uh, some of the questions are referring to, to the need for Ecuador to uh, make a, a smooth transitions from the current situation based on oil exports uh, to a new, more sustainable economy. Fortunately, Ecuador is a very uh, uh, important uh, biodiverse country, has a, a natural endowment with uh, abundant water and soil fertility. Uh, so uh, I think it is very important to consolidate in the short term uh, other uh, export services, for example, tourism. Actually, uh, uh, if we uh, try to overcome the uh, COVID crisis, in 2019, uh, tourism revenues represented the third largest export uh, uh, source in Ecuador. We have also an important expansion of non-oil exports based mostly on agriculture and uh, uh, agricultural-based uh, uh, manufacturing products, such as uh, chocolate, for example, and so on. So uh, from this perspective, I think it's important to, to, to consolidate these uh, transitions towards a more service-based economy in the future. I think uh, uh, a bioeconomy based, based on research and service uh, uh, based on biodiversity is feasible in the future. I think in Latin America, we have an interesting example of Costa Rica, a country smaller than, than Ecuador, but in the case of Costa Rica, deforestation is completely stopped. Uh, and uh, 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 tourism and biodiversity service as the most important uh, export uh, revenue uh, sector. I think this can be applied in Ecuador. Ecuador has also a very important uh, cultural biodiversity, a colonial heritage, uh, so that uh, this transition might be feasible, but it needs a strong uh, state support. It needs the creation, the consolidation of competitive advantage, uh, uh, and also I think a, a strong committee both from the public sector and the private sector. The transition is difficult, but I think it's feasible. Uh, regarding uh, the situation in the Yasuni National Park, actually the, the government uh, since 2016 is extracting oil from the Yasuni. Uh, however, we have a recent uh, uh, ban uh, from the constitutional court to expand it, uh, the, about half of the planet uh, uh, oil fields. Uh, in the case of Yasuni, so I think at least half of the reserve can be kept indefinitely underground. And in addition to that, there is a strong civil movement trying to stop the expansion of oil uh, um, exploitation within uh, the national, the Yasuni National Park. And regarding uh, an additional question, I think uh, 
actually the transition does not uh, will be based only on deforestation reduction, but also I think the potential in Ecuador for uh, sustainable energy sources is very high. We have a very uh, high uh, solar energy potential. We are the country with more uh, energy coming from the sun in, in, in the world, given that we are on the Equatorian line. Uh, the potential for other sources, hydroelectric, small scale dams, and uh, wind is also important. Uh, so uh, geothermal uh, sources are also important. So I think Ecuador has a strong potential for placing its currently oil based economy with a sustainable energy uh, profile. Uh, actually, most of the Chinese uh, debt is coming from the public sector, the Chinese Development Bank and other institutions, uh, but it's basically a public uh, debt. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. I'll ask a couple more questions that are here in the um, in the chat, and then we'll let you make any cl closing remarks that uh, that you'd, you'd like to make to, to wrap it up. Uh, two of them are the, the last two questions I have here are from uh, actually there's three uh, from two of them from GDP Center, but one is from L. Lohman, um, or excuse me, no, uh, Ivan Yanes uh, from Acción Ecológica from Ecuador and asks, do biodiversity services, quote, imply biodiversity offsets, question mark? If so, do such offsets not entail the loss of biodiversity elsewhere? Uh, Rebecca Ray from our team here at the GDP Center uh, would just like to know more about the Ikeam University. Uh, was that partly founded with, uh, with Chinese loans? And, and what are some of the conservation efforts that are happening there uh, that could be supported or enhanced with, uh, with this smaller additional deal proposal is her question. And then uh, Zara Albright, uh, who's a fellow here at the GDP Center and a PhD student at Boston University says, one of the new trends in China economic relations is the increasing exports of balsa wood from Ecuador to build wind turbines in China, which has led to even more deforestation, even though it supports green renewable energy. Does your proposal address the competing incentives for reducing deforestation and demand for renewable energy raw materials, especially in the context of China's green energy transition? So we'll let you ask, answer those three questions and any closing remarks you might have. Thank you very much. First, uh, I would like to refer um, quickly about uh, Ikeam University. It was an Amazonian uh, basing university created uh, several years ago, mostly based on a Chinese loan. The Chinese uh, actually um, financed uh, uh, laboratories, um, an important part of the research uh, infrastructure of the university. Uh, that's why uh, we have a, this loan that can, the idea is to include the, this loan in the debt for nature swap uh, so that uh, uh, a further conservation policy it can be applied. The Ikeam University is located very close to a national reserve, the Colossal uh, uh, Chalupas Reserve, uh, so that we can strong uh, the policy of reserve protection at the same time promote research, national research on biodiversity. That is essentially the idea of the proposal. A second question is linked uh, uh, to the problem of balsa in Ecuador. Actually, uh, balsa is, uh, is, is very uh, light and strong, and it has been used as a raw material uh, for wind turbines, mostly in China. Uh, so that in the recent in the recent years we have an increase in deforestation in Ecuador, uh, with a problem of exporting balsa to to wind uh, turbines. Uh, so that's a serious problem, and I think uh, it can be addressed in several ways. Uh, but 
we need in Ecuador, we, we, we can think of a substitution of the raw material. Uh, that's a technological problem, but at the same time, we need a more uh, solid control of deforestation. Uh, uh, and that can be done uh, using satellite information. Actually, Ecuador is lacking, is still lacking uh, a strong deforestation control policy. And that is very important. Uh, uh, so that I think uh, the problem, uh, this problem is, is interesting because of the trade-offs between international conservation and deforestation in the case of Ecuador. I am, and finally, uh, when I am uh, talking about uh, um, uh, bioeconomy, agroeconomy based on, on research, I'm not necessarily talking about uh, offsets or about market value uh, compensation uh, between conservation and deforestation that can take place uh, 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 otherwise or in other parts of the, of the planet. The idea is uh, to try to, to create other opportunities based on, on, on research on biodiversity uh, and, and, and change in the uh, uh, property rights of uh, biodiversity service uh, worldwide. Well, uh, thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, Dr. Rea, in the chat here, uh, folks can get access to the full proposal by Dr. Larea and his colleagues um, in Spanish and short opinion articles that were published in the China Dialogue in Chinese and in English. Uh, also, uh, the GDP Center published an article in Science uh, last year about, uh, about the potential for uh, debt for climate and nature swaps with China and has a short interactive database that you can, uh, you can look at uh, the case of Ecuador and, and other countries. Before uh, we thank uh, Dr. Larea for coming today, again, I wanna invite everyone to come back tomorrow at 10 a.m. EST, where we'll hear Dr. Stephen Kaplan of George Washington University talk about his new book on the political economy of Chinese finance in, the, in Latin America, uh, and very uh, timed, interesting, timely pair with today's presentation. Well, Dr. Larea, thank you so much for sharing your proposal with us and, and our large audience here. Uh, this is not only uh, being done live and, and being live streamed on YouTube, but it'll also be available on the GDP Center YouTube channel so folks can uh, take a look and, and go in more deeper. We wish you the best of luck with your proposal, and thanks so much for joining us on behalf of the GDP Center and, and the large audience that we had today. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to the, for this presentation, and uh, thank you all the, the people who are in the public for listening. So we expect to continue being in touch and I will be able to, to ask any kind of uh, further questions you may have uh, by, by email. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great day.